Do you know Gene Sharp? He was a, a objector to the Vietnam War, and okay. he and Albert Einstein corresponded, and he was yeah. kind of a leader in creating the nonviolent uh, yeah. uh, action. So he, he he did a whole sort of thesis on how nonviolence or nonviolent uh, mm -hmm. protest actually is more effective than violence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. did this whole but, NBC school. Yes, yeah, that's right. And so then, so he, so he created an uh, institute called the Albert Einstein Institution. Mm -hmm. And then there's a young woman named Jamila Rakib, who okay. was a, uh, a fellow with me at the Media Lab, and she's running the institution. He died. And she's um, kind of now tr getting a network of both um, scholars as well as activists who are kind of, um, uh, who are supporting this nonviolent action thing. And she wanted to reach out to you. Can I connect you? Of on, course. On, of course. On, on I mean, my, my email is, is public oh, knowledge. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, it's on Twitter. But if, okay. Uh, my work email is this, okay. so, so feel okay. free to okay. just write I, 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 she's, she's wonderful. So, um, so, so yeah, so, and, I, and I enjoyed your comments yesterday, and it connects very much with what we're doing in Japan. So okay. just to give you an update, um, uh, so Prime Minister Kishida took power last year, and as he was coming into office, they were trying to figure out what to do. So they created sort of three different clusters of discussion in the government. One was um, a new kind of capitalism because the young people were reading communist books and they were thinking that in a, that you know, capitalism was a cause of many of the problems, which is part of what this book is about. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was they wanted to help local governments and they've been trying forever to help local regions. Obviously there's a political reason to do that. Mm -hmm. And then the, the um, and then the third one was they thought they needed to help startups. So they had all these committees, and last year as NFTs were growing and Web3 was growing, I, was, I started to talk to people about it. And, you know, and I think that the Japanese government realized um, that, and there's a small group of politicians working on this, that Web3 was a good way to connect all these things together. We can do DAOs and local governments, it's a new kind of capitalism, yes. and it uh, can help startups. So, so the, uh, the team, and I, I helped them put together a report that Kishida-san actually embraced. And he started saying that Web3 is kind of a pillar of the new Japanese um, reform. And interestingly, last year, towards the end of the year, you know, there was, we were all talking about Web3. Um, even the opposition party uh, campaigned uh, support of Web3. So Japan became very pro-Web3. And then, um, and then, and then Japan, just to give a little bit of history, so like 2013-14, when Mt. Gox was hacked, it put Bitcoin on the map. But interestingly, what happened after that discussion was Japan passed one of the first, mm -hmm. I think the first sort of federal level um, mm -hmm. payment systems, digital mm -hmm. uh, asset law. After the mainstreaming efforts. That's, yes. that's right. Mm -hmm. And then, um, which then unlocked the ability for people to make exchanges. So it took off in Japan. But then in 2018, we had the coin check hack. And, and I was at the JFSA helping them at the time. And they tightened it so much that you couldn't do anything. So Japan has been basically crypto offline from 2018 until now. So they, so after um, FTX and Terra, Terra Luna happened, very few Japanese were exposed to that risk. Mm -hmm. so, so the way I've been describing is Japan was sitting in a penalty box mm -hmm. while everybody else was skating around and now they're all on the floor <laughs> and they were just opening the penalty box and Japan's coming skating out. And also because Japan is quite secluded you know, I wrote a book and others have been talking and we've been able to change the narrative for Web3 in Japan to be more about, um, you know, a lot of the things you talked about. So as a new way to coordinate nonprofit efforts, research, local governments, and trying to shift away from the kind of crypto trader to the sort of normal people. Um, one of the challenges is that the regulations were created before we had smart contracts. So it, it, made, it treats digital currency and yeah, assets. Yeah, we noticed that. Yeah. The classification is different from everybody else. That's, that's right. And it's yeah. beca because we only saw Bitcoin. Uh, okay. Um, and it was good at the beginning because it was clear, but it's now clear in the wrong way. So you, so they have you have to pay tax mm -hmm. on digital currency as if it's cash, mm -hmm. which is bad. So anyway, so, so but the government got so behind it. So now we passed the stablecoin law. We uh, are in the process of trying to pass a DAO law. And we're trying to change our regulations so that for things like NFTs and DAOs, um, we can uh, focus more on the social benefit. Mm -hmm. I think what's important globally, so like, for instance, the reason, as you know, that, that 
capital gains taxes low is the theory that those sorts of investments help society. And no one right now thinks that crypto helps society, so they don't want to help. <laughs> we, we do, yes. <laughs> but, 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 but we have to prove it. Yes. And, 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 the chick, and the chicken and egg we have now is that most of the governments don't want to make a law unless, unless they're good examples. But the people who are trying to make good examples don't want to break the law, so they're waiting for the law. So it's a little chicken and egg. So what I'm trying to do with the Japanese government is to come up with good examples mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of social benefit mm -hmm. from Web3. Yep. So, you know, so, you, uh, so you know Halseki even better than I do. So, so he and I are working on this quite a bit. So at my university, Chiba Institute of Technology, we, we made an um, uh, uh, NFT-based, uh, 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 what's it called, a, um, uh, a certificate of completion mm -hmm. of my class. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, we did it on the blockchain. And the reason we did that, and we used the block certs, which my team created at Media Lab, it's an open uh, protocol for certification and uses um, the W3C, um, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what is it? The Decentralized Identifiers. Yeah, it's, it's using the ADs essentially. It's doing the verifiable credentials. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then Hal wanted to do certificates at the digital agency, so we just gave him the code. We have made it all open source. And now we went to Nepal, mm -hmm. and the education minister of Nepal signed a thing saying that he's going to do it, mm -hmm. and Vietnam is going to do it. And so what we're trying to do is to, to build this, uh, uh, and, and I'm trying very hard to keep it unofficial. So, so one of the things is we're trying not to force standardization around DID or anything, just to try to create interoperability. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we're trying to, because I, when I'm, when I'm, one of the things I'm saying, and I don't know, I want to get your opinion on this, but I'm saying that the problem with a lot of the standards process in Japan is that it's centralized. You have to have, you end up with a committee and a chairman and a blah, 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 blah. It's a mutex. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's yeah, a giant lock. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a centralized uh -huh. thing. So what's neat about this uh, NFT-based one is that everyone can do it without permission. Mm -hmm. It's all open source. And as long as we keep interoperability, we don't force anybody to do one mm -hmm. thing or the other. Um, and so at the digital agency, um, Hal was involved, but we had a study group around Web3. Um, and we decided to make a DAO. Mm -hmm. And so we now have a DAO, and Hal and me and some of the other board members are doing it. But what we're thinking about is opening this up. And we're thinking of having the uh, things like this uh, um, digital certificate mm -hmm. discussion in the DAO and inviting the other ministries, as well as um, pe people from the public and private sector, as well as other countries. And to and, and we already announced that we have a DAO. So it's kind of neat because the first kind of public DAO in Japan is the is spinning out of the digital agency. Mm -hmm. And and we're trying to make that an example because I think what will be neat, because it's a DAO, we'll, we'll, we're going to build like a consensus building process. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it will be modeled around the work that you've done, is mm -hmm. that it will still have some credibility because mm -hmm. we have all these people who are building consensus to make a statement and we'll send those statements into the government mm -hmm. and I'm getting individuals from the different ministries to join but I'm trying to make it kind of like a, a, a very DAO-like association that's going to have opinions about mm -hmm. digital policy um, and I'm trying to connect it out internationally as well so so anyway, so that's that's the experiment, and, and Hal's very central to this, and and I know, um, and we're trying to figure out who who else to bring in and what who else we can learn from. Mm -hmm. So and and so it's, it's a multi pronged thing. So we're trying to make an example for for mm -hmm. DAOs. We're trying to create a new way of doing coordination without over standardization, mm -hmm. and we're trying to make a, a a kind of a global network there. And so mm -hmm. I'm curious if this plugs into any. Any, anything you're doing here. Yeah, indeed, uh, there's a dedicated uh, DAO Web3 uh, section within our ministry oh, really? uh, in the Department of Democracy Network. Um, we don't have a Department of International Cooperation. Okay. Uh, it's called Democracy and Network, Network. Okay. Yeah, the DN. Uh, and the reason we chose this name is that we want to network with uh, people who are pro-democracy, even if they live in authoritarian regimes. Mm. So it's a different yeah. take uh, of public diplomacy. Uh, mm -hmm. And Web3 is actually perfect for mm -hmm. this. Um, as I mentioned uh, in my uh, opening keynote uh, in the afternoon uh, yesterday, participation for innovative public good is easier to prove if you show that this is for international solidarity-based security. Mm -hmm. uh, because 
public security, including national defense, mm -hmm. is by default a public good. Mm -hmm. It is actually the textbook example of a public good. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, as long as your military doesn't try to attack other neighboring <laughs> countries, of course. <laughs> and defense oriented <laughs> public security is by default a public good. So, um, and, and uh, those are great to establish this coordination between um, the countries uh, mm -hmm. who don't otherwise have track one mm -hmm. uh, diplomatic ties. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, uh, Taiwan and Japan were not very close mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to track one, but still not fully mm -hmm. track one. Uh, but Taiwan and other jurisdictions uh, that are still, you know, trying to figure out uh, how to, how close to be uh, mm -hmm. with Taiwan. I was choosing mm -hmm. Lithuania, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so uh, they can give me uh, e-residency. Mm -hmm. Like w w without any uh, doubt, mm -hmm. so I'm a Lithuanian e-resident, yeah, cool. uh, which means that I get to sign contracts uh, mm -hmm. as a Lithuanian, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and therefore part of uh, EU, and yeah. therefore part of EIDAS, and mm -hmm. therefore part of the uh, European blockchain. Uh, and mm -hmm. so uh, the idea is that the individualization of uh, each individual in Taiwan, uh, we have this DAO zero, mm -hmm. EAO zero, so like of zero, uh, but mm -hmm. for DAO. Uh, it is a Gov Zero project, mm -hmm. and a lot of uh, DM people uh, and myself mm -hmm. is involved mm -hmm. uh, in the Dow Zero. Uh, however, we phrase it so that it's international at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that we want to build as replacing our local association structure mm -hmm. uh, with local government and so on. Because for domestic registered associations, yeah. I mean, they, they already have a pretty good co-op or association mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure. However, for the international uh, mm -hmm. joining it, mm -hmm. it's difficult, mm -hmm. right? So uh, our main strategy is just to say, okay, if you have an international DAO, mm -hmm. uh, we don't force you to set up a local association, that's not practical. Mm -hmm. However, we will uh, hand that DAO uh, a legal personhood uh, uh, e-residency. Mm -hmm. So like e-residency for DAOs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so if your DAO, for example, mm -hmm. uh, is interested in having um, members uh, that are Taiwanese, mm -hmm. then we're happy to just give your DAO mm -hmm. a kind of legal personhood okay. uh, certificate, a XCA, uh, mm -hmm. which we issue uh, from Taiwan. So that uh, established a mutually recognizable digital signature link, mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't uh, necessarily confer company status, for, for mm -hmm. example, for tax purposes. Mm -hmm. And so by defining this as an international association legal personhood, we avoid this whole uh, company uh, tax uh, uh, whatever you, you just talk about, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of like over sorting it into the bin uh, of mm -hmm. for profit company uh, sense. So I think uh, there's a lot of negative That's really interesting. Yeah. And maybe maybe we should look at doing something similar in Japan um, mm -hmm. because maybe we should try to put that in the upcoming down mm -hmm. law. Mm -hmm. um, because what we're trying to do, we um, it's the they <laughs> the, the, uh, the the Liberal Democratic Party team that's going to do a, a, a politician's law proposal. Um, they're trying to find ways to carve out um, applications of DAOs mm -hmm. that shouldn't be uh, overly regulated. And so mm -hmm. it sounds similar. So so the is is and I'm sure this is all online. The, yeah, it's all online, okay. and, and I can okay. connect you to the DM people okay. in charge of this. So. Because it would be interesting if, to mm -hmm. see if we can do a, a similar thing and cooperate there. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Um, in terms of local governments, are you doing any DAO-like support for co-ops and things like that? Yeah, definitely, yeah. yes. Uh, a lot of uh, the local government municipality and so on um, have worked with people who uh, joined our uh, it's called quadratic funding, I would say about three thing, uh, QF, um, um, a venture, right? Mm -hmm. It's a, like a QF incubator that we launched um, at 100100adi.gov.tw ADI for Administration for Digital Industries. Uh, so the 100.adi.gov.tw uh, work basically asks the people who work locally mm -hmm. to reimagine their services if uh, the communication technology has advanced to a point where co-presence uh, is uh, a reality. Mm -hmm. So a, a, a projection from what they used to deliver locally mm -hmm. to what could work actually across distance. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 
they submit those uh, ideas uh, and uh, uh, the top 100, uh, we coach them to, because in Taiwan crowdfunding platforms are very popular, mm -hmm. uh, to do a uh, not for profit, but for good uh, um, crowdfunding round. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the crowdfunding uh, sites all agree in a privacy enhancing way to share the kind of unique uh, individuals uh, that joined. So if you join on this crowdfunding platform, that platform, platform, but you're the same uh, individual, then you only count as one vote mm -hmm. uh, for quadratic uh, funding. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we uh, calculate the score as uh, the sum of all the square roots mm -hmm. of each individual contribution, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that to get uh, a lot of people joining is as important, if not more important, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. one wealthy uh, mm -hmm. donor. Mm -hmm. Because the traditional problem with matching funds is that you can just get a loan with a very yeah. large yeah. <laughs> donor and then you win everything. Right? So, uh, and then with quadratic funding, we are surfacing the top 20 or so mm -hmm. uh, and elevate them uh, from the local DAO or local association into a national or even international uh, yeah. presence. And for the those within it that we can see a necessity Mm -hmm. uh, then maybe we use the Universal Service Fund mm -hmm. uh, or many other funding uh, sources at our disposal mm -hmm. uh, to say that this is now as essential mm -hmm. uh, as, you know, broadband as a human right and mm -hmm. so on. So uh, basically we rely on the collective intelligence mm -hmm. uh, to solve the traditional uh, safety innovation mm -hmm. dilemma. Mm -hmm. uh, we trust that the top 20 that wins this quadratic mm -hmm. funding round mm -hmm. will already have overcome the mm -hmm. dilemma mm -hmm. and can show us how to overcome it together. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And and so, are you using some blockchain based ID mm -hmm. system for the mm -hmm. for the federated mm -hmm. network of quadratic funding? Yeah. So uh, because we currently limit to only uh, I think uh, residents and citizens, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a very strong PKI based uh, mm -hmm. authentication mechanism already. We don't have to use uh, mm -hmm. the IDs for this round. Yeah. Uh, however. Uh, the many cases that joined us uh, in this 100 proposed to connect, for example, with uh, so-called overseas compatriots, right? So second and third generation Taiwanese. Mm -hmm. uh, and for them, uh, we don't have a good PKI yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah. Right? So we have to either cross-recognize uh, mm -hmm. with the, whatever their country's PKI is, mm -hmm. or we'll have to invent something based on the DID. Mm -hmm. So it's on the... Um, elevation of those ideas to the international level part later this year mm -hmm. uh, that we will have to adopt the ID. So we joined W3C and FIDO with mm -hmm. this particular use case. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And, and this is also, is this the Gov Zero people that are working on this or is where? Yeah, well, I'm Gov Zero people got, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, so the, the boundary is yeah. actually uh, very blurry. Right? Uh -huh. um, we, we have uh, those Zero people who are also full-time staff uh, at the DM uh, okay. working on Web3. I see. Uh, and uh, Mashbin is the name. Uh, and uh, he had to declare a like non-conflict of interest. Uh -huh. uh, and then all the DAO members uh, that he founded, the, the Vol DAO, um, that uh, have signed, saying that we are truly a non-profit, yeah. non-organization. Yeah. <laughs> right? uh, and and uh, of course, they signed um, not very digitally, so we have to fix that. But okay. anyway, so, so the point I'm making is that we want to encourage overlaps. Uh, and, and we think a lot of the governance uh, hiccups mm -hmm. is because the people who work on safety, security, mm -hmm. um, innovation, progress, uh, and on democratic participation, uh, they don't talk to each other's groups. Mm -hmm. But if mm -hmm. someone can belong to all three groups together, mm -hmm. and if we have that uh, much of those someone's as part of the DN, the mm -hmm. then we stand ready to engage in a way that doesn't feel bureaucratic uh, and top down. I see, I see. That's interesting. Yeah, we should get Hal to become the head of mm -hmm. digital agency that he can have a mirror organization. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. that's, that's very interesting. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll poke Hal and we'll, we'll see if we can, because mm -hmm. I know I, I know the DID thing is also very important in Japan, and it's not exactly the same, but we have also the My Number card that's rolling out yes. and, and trying to figure out uh, the international piece. I guess Japan mm -hmm. isn't as focused on helping international people as much as you, but the one area, and this is where mm -hmm. Taiwan, uh, uh, for where Vietnam and Nepal come in, is Japan needs more uh, engineering talent. Exactly. 
and this becomes an important. So are you giving yeah. them e residency so that they can experience the feeling of being Japanese before actually joining? You? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, mm -hmm. I think that they are, they are, we are actually starting to um, talk about uh, helping with the visa application using That's right. using this um, credentialing. Um, mm -hmm. Do you do you have an e credentialing system? I'm sure yes. you do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and what what's where does that live mm -hmm. and what's the protocol? Sure. So a couple of things. <clears throat> so our digital uh, signature act, mm -hmm. uh, which was done around the turn of the century, yeah. already allows for recognizing uh, overseas uh, CAs. Okay. So all it takes for us, uh, which we did uh, last year, is to simply say that anything that the uh, NIST uh, or the ISO or uh, whatever uh, international organization uh, ratifies uh, as a credentialing uh, uh, signature system, mm -hmm. uh, we uh, strongly suggest automatically recognize mm -hmm. it to count as uh, legal uh, mm -hmm. in Taiwan. So this is a kind of one-way notarization uh, recognition. Uh, the other way uh, can be done uh, quite easily by uh, making sure that we use the standardized uh, FIDO, PKCS, and so on, those infrastructures, mm -hmm. uh, and then just publish uh, it to a place like IPFS, mm -hmm. uh, where everybody else automatically have access. Mm -hmm. So this is like the time when I uh, sent a pull request to the Tokyo yeah. Metropolitan uh, yeah. COVID dashboard, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of uh, doing a track one, like uh, my ambassador talked to your ambassador, yeah. uh, it's the public place that's GitHub that I just yeah. sent a pull request. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, yeah. that, that's our strategy. Oh, yeah. That's very cool. Uh -huh. Interesting, and and that's consistent with, with with what I'm trying to do with uh -huh. this um, credentialing process, where mm -hmm. you just write it to the blockchain, and exactly. We just yes. uh, have uh -huh. brainstorming meetings, not regulatory uh -huh. meetings. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you, you know that there was a? I don't know if they still do it, but the um, um, there were these um, ha hacker clubs, and um, what was it called again? I think I think it was called like hackerspaces.net or something. Uh -huh. And the heads of these hacker spaces would meet, uh -huh. and they're all like pirates. They're all independent. Uh -huh. But what they did was they they um, had meetings and they 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 shared patterns. So there's like some of the ones that I like. There was one called the bike shed pattern, and the bike shed pattern was, you know, complicated things like let's build a nuclear mm -hmm. reactor. Most people don't understand, so they don't have an opinion. But when they're arguing about the color of the bike shed, everybody has an opinion. You we're, start, we're all experts. We're all, and, and it takes the whole meeting. <laughs> yes. And so what they do is they say, okay, if somebody, if we start spending too much time mm -hmm. on stupid point, they call bike shed pattern, yeah. and everybody knows what it means. Yeah. So what they did was they write it up, and then they share these patterns with everybody, each other. Do you know this? And and, yeah. and, and so so that I thought I think is a really good way of governance where everyone's sharing, um, but not forcing, mm -hmm. and the best practices win, right? Yeah, and I exactly. think that's a stick merging. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So. So, so it, it would be interesting. So let me, I'll, I'll, I'll look this up as well, because then maybe we can, because um, I think publishing to IPFS is interesting. We haven't thought of that. So mm -hmm. I'll suggest that. With Our me. entire website, moda.gov.tw, is on IPFS. Okay. So IPNS, colon slash slash, moda.gov.tw. Mm -hmm. uh, and during the cyber attack uh, last August, a lot of people just volunteered to keep us afloat. Oh, interesting. Uh, and, and so this is a very strong participation for a safety case. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because Web3 technologies grow up in an adverse environment. Mm -hmm. Yes. So its value only shine when there's actual adversity. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to? Yeah, you can say something. Nice to meet you. Um, yes. uh, I'm Charlien. Yeah, I had what questions you asked, but it's not really related to the government. No, it's okay. It's okay. We're, we're at, at a good point anyway. <laughs> so, because of my background as a Korean Chinese and, and, and Japanese, um, yes. And being a transcultural person yeah. myself, um, finding a community for mm. me was always very important because I don't have one clear identity where I could call home. Mm. But at the same time, that means that anywhere can be home. So I've always used like online communities. I had a Facebook page when I was 15 years old to find like like-minded people who's like me um, and then to build my own identity using online platforms. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's my first time in Taipei uh -huh. uh, this time. Okay. And what I realized is it seems like the way my generation and the, the younger people are engaged with some of your, uh, like the government uh, mm -hmm. 
work and also because of your um, your work in raising awareness on the citizens' involvement with some of the government act really have strengthened the relationship between like my generation people with the government. So I was wondering like what has been the challenges that you went through during this South phase and mm -hmm. what do you think are the opportunities, especially in the context of Web3, mm -hmm. uh, to strengthen this uh, your relationship with the citizen and especially for people of my age? That's kind of the question. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it's a seminar topic that I <laughs> <laughs> talk for three hours about. <laughs> yeah. The, the core challenge um, is, as I mentioned, the uh, innovation safety dilemma. Uh, and of course, young people want to participate, but some want to participate to enhance safety and some want to participate to enhance innovation, the speed of innovation. Uh, and in many jurisdictions, those two groups of people don't necessarily talk to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, they develop different norms, different cultures uh, around safety and innovation, uh, respectively. Uh, and then the social media came. Mm -hmm. And then it amplified what used to be simple disagreements into tribal fights, <laughs> uh, polarization, uh, and so on. So it's not that the young people are susceptible to tribal fights or uh, vain social status comparisons and so on or whatever, but rather the, the space in which they interact in uh, is sometimes antisocial by default, mm -hmm. uh, by elevating uh, the the takes, the, the dunks, right? Uh, the retweets, <laughs> and so on. So, so this is like, like a virus. So that's the main challenge in that uh, there's a generation of people whose identity is found on the overlapping intersectionality mm -hmm. of the groups that we belong. So we're all multi-homed people and our identity is on those intersections. Yet, uh, we engage in platforms that amplify only the conflicting part of those overlaps mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of the pro-social part of the overlaps. So that's the main challenge. So uh, the main um, work that we, we do is just to find uh, new patterns. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes as simple as saying there's no reply button that creates a thread, uh, but rather elevating like the community notes on Twitter, only the voices that speaks broadly to the people of dividing ideologies. So nonviolent communication actually uh, as code. So by creating those spaces, we magically then see that the young people who care about environmental um, like sustainability and so on uh, can see that uh, the people who care about, say, uh, innovation in, in material sciences and community organization or very diverse fields, mm -hmm. they now see a common goal to bond together instead of fighting over the trivialities, uh, the bike shedding. So raising the agenda setting power to the collective intelligence through a pro-social space, that's the main challenge. Right. It's kind of like you had a forum, right? Three mm -hmm. years ago yes. and you didn't have a reply mm -hmm. button. And right, exactly. Yeah, it's still to this day, like join.gov.tw. Uh, we didn't invent that. That came from uh, police from Seattle uh, and uh, there's two columns, pro and con, but no reply between those two columns uh, came from Iceland, from Better de Kavik. Uh, yeah. yeah, I like the fact that you can still dislike, you can still disagree, of but course. you just can't reply. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Is that still going on though? Yeah, join that GOV is still going on. It's inspired by V Taiwan. So V Taiwan was 2014, uh, join GOV 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, and then V Taiwan relies on a lot of grassroots organization. So uh, the group was uh, not meeting as frequently during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, but join that GOV still is very active. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we work together with many people younger than 18 who to which the join platform was their only agenda setting platform because they couldn't vote, you see. <laughs> so, so they worked together with people who are 70 years old mm -hmm. right, to set a lot of very innovative uh, policy agendas on the join platform. Oh, that's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. And what do you think it's like the, um, I'll say 20s and 30s perception towards mm -hmm. the digital um, ministry here mm -hmm. and um, how much are they involved Right now, because I feel like in Japan, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm saying this as a non Japanese, yeah. I feel like just young generation, they don't really vote in general. Mm -hmm. They're not, they don't think that their, their voices are heard mm -hmm. um, to the government's act. Uh, but I feel mm -hmm. like the case is slightly opposite here. What would they like and unlike? Surely that's voting. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but they don't have that, I don't think. And then yeah. I don't think they see the need of having them um, 
having to raise their voice, even though they have a different opinion. I don't think they see the need to raise their voice, but I think it's slightly opposite here. So I was, exactly. So I was wondering, what do you think really triggered this this community of uh, citizen government in a you know, single like a community or whatever? Yeah, as I mentioned, it's all about whether you share agenda setting power. Mm -hmm. uh, because the thing for nuclear plants uh, is that it's hard to share agenda setting power because it requires so much context. Mm -hmm. And so the people who can contextualize these already know each other anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that makes the conversation more exclusive to those people. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, uh, that means actually we should work on generative AI to solve the contextualization <laughs> problem. But before that happened, <laughs> um, the, the younger people in many jurisdictions feel that all they get to work on are trivial issues like bike shedding. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> the nuclear plant is going to be built, but let's talk about the, the painting on the wall or whatever. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and, and of course, that leads to a sense of learning helplessness. Like if I spend time on this, uh, and I don't have agenda setting power. Somebody else set the agenda with the context I don't understand, and then I get to suggest the color of the wall, uh, right? So, so that's that's the the kind of number one reason for learned helplessness for many of the younger generation. On the other hand, um, if we don't uh, see the younger generation as simply voices, but rather we call them uh, digital transformation ambassadors. Uh, in MODA, the T Ambassadors program, as people who freshly graduated or even not yet graduated, to be ambassadors from the digital world mm -hmm. to the analog world. Mm -hmm. uh, and five of them in a team would work with the local social entrepreneur, night market, whatever, to help them digitally transform. Uh, and when that happens, they have all the agenda setting power. Mm -hmm. uh, because the, the elderly people and so on, all want to connect to more people. Mm -hmm. But the younger people, by default, know what to do. Right. Uh, and so instead of saying IT, which would only limit the people to a very tiny percentage, exactly. yeah. uh, we say digital natives, mm -hmm. which is everyone. Right. Um, and so uh, I think 87% of RT ambassadors mm -hmm. didn't come from an IT background. Mm -hmm. So maybe philosophy, music, culture, whatever. But they are digital natives. And so uh, they don't work as interns, rather they work as ambassadors. I think that framing is very important. And do you reward these ambassadors? Yeah, of course, uh, have a year of pay subsidized by the government. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right, and, and also uh, NFTs, uh, so bound oh. NFTs uh, that show their contributions, their impact certificates, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So uh, I think for, for these young people, having the impact certificates to their name um, is uh, even more tangible right. than this coin. Yeah. Because it's hard to show this coin across a uh, video conference <laughs> and convey the graphy that. <laughs> but if there's a digital signature uh, from the digital ministry, uh, that's easily verified. Right. Right? So I'm on Ethereum and Tezos and so on. I have those silver coins too. Right, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much. That's a good name, Impact Certificates. Yeah. Yeah, we, should, we, should use, we should do that. Impact mm -hmm. Certificate. Impact Certificate. <laughs> they'll, they'll always say, I see. I see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah I, I think the, the term hypercerts, Hyper uh, yeah, I, I translated that as uh, Chao Zheng. Chao as in Chao super, yeah. Zheng oh. uh, as in a cert, right? So it's easy to remember. Ah. Uh, that's yeah, hyper great. cert, that's three syllables, but mm -hmm. Chaojin, two syllables. Mm -hmm. uh, by default, the less syllables uh, win the mimetic yeah. war, right? <laughs> and that could be translated into Japanese kanji, too. Uh, okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Uh, one, one interesting thing I we realized, we, we gave away, I think, two or three hundred certificates for the class two classes that we did. Um, and uh, I think in Japan right now, people, it's like, wallets is like three and a half, four percent. But every single student created a wallet to receive exactly. a certificate. Exactly. So everybody, I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a good reason for people to get into exactly. And, and they're not, you know, crypto, anarcho, libertarian, uh, maximalists, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so I think for the T ambassador, we deliberately chose the Kukai wallet for the Tezos blockchain, meaning that all they have to do is to sign up with their Gmail or 
whatever, mm -hmm. which is not total decentralization. Yeah. But it's good enough because the Gmail uh, sign-in is actually a digital uh, signature right. that can be transformed into a Tezos uh, mm -hmm. wallet. Mm -hmm. So it's not like Google now can sign on their behalf. It's yeah. still um, like multi-factor authentication. And if they want a code wallet or something, they can just transfer uh, to right. that particular way. Yeah. Right. Right. Very interesting. Um, are you going to be visiting Japan again sometime? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so now I'm going to the parliamentary defense uh, oh, in uh, 10 minutes, yeah. <laughs> actually 5 minutes. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, this whole session uh, runs till the end of May. Okay. Uh, so even if it ex extends a little bit, usually by mid-June, I'll be able to travel okay. uh, until the end of August because the session uh, begins again in September. Okay. So during that time, I can do uh, extended okay. travels. So Japan uh, Blockchain Week is end of June, beginning of July. Oh, so that might be a good time great. to come. Yeah. There'll be a lot of things going on. And I, and, I, and I think that, you know, with your work, and also if we get lucky and we are able to move forward in Japan, I feel like maybe Taiwan and Japan are going to be the two countries that are using blockchain the most for pro-social stuff, yeah, for this you know, no period. Behind. Yeah, <laughs> leaving no one behind. And I think we can maybe, because what I want to do is I want to reset the mm -hmm. sort of global agenda around this to be focused more on the, um, the, the social impact and less on just, um, mm -hmm. um, um, I think it's important, the, the payment rails and the finance, but mm -hmm. it's going to happen anyway. And exactly. There's a lot of them, there are not people already excited about it. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think, and, and talking to even the Europeans, there are people now that are interested in it, but it's just, there's not enough um, uh, activity. So I think mm. we can amplify that. That would be great. Yeah, very much so. Yes. so well, thank you. Thank you. Very so fruitful much. conversation. Thank you.